If you will, turn with me to that little book of Obadiah. Obadiah. We've been going through uh, the, the different books of the Minor Prophets, and uh, we've made it to one of the smallest uh, books, if not the smallest book, of the Old Testament. And Obadiah is one of those books where you, you're right in the midst of the Minor Prophets, and so if you're going through uh, the Bible in a year, you, you get to this, and it's usually part of um, either you're reading in Jonah, or it's your part of your reading in Amos, and so you just quickly find fly by it. But I want us to stop, and I want us to look at Obadiah in a much more greater depth and an appreciation of this little book. Because this little book, in the verses that we read, again, we think, how encouraging is that? I mean, everything that we just looked at, I mean, the, this nation's going to be destroyed, and boy, I, I'm just going to leave church today so encouraged. I think that you will be. I think that you'll be encouraged, but also uh, our reading of the text, our understanding of the text, isn't always to make us feel good. I, I hope that you never open your Bible. There are going to be those days where you're going to open up the text and you're going to come across verses that just lift your spirits, that comfort your soul. But there are also going to be moments in Scripture where it makes you look inwardly. And it makes you understand, I am a sinner, I am living this life before a holy God, and I've been doing things wrong. And that's where we get to Obadiah. But in that, in, in that time can come a, a time of restoration and repentance, and through that can come tremendous amounts of encouragement. We get to Obadiah. And this, along with one other book of the Old Testament, or one of the other minor prophets, was not written to Israel, or for Israel, or even to Judah. It was written to a nation called Edom. And this was the sin of Edom. This is what they were doing. And God used Obadiah to give this prophecy to them because they were not treating Israel kindly. This, along with Jonah, Jonah was written, we understand, to the Ninevites and how he, was, he went and how he was to proclaim uh, that, uh, that Nineveh turned from their wicked ways and turned from their sin and turned to God. Otherwise, God will judge them and, 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 um, and discipline them. But we come to this book, Obadiah, that was not written to Israel or, for, um, or to Judah, but rather it was written to another nation, and that brought encouragement to the, the Israelites. Because we, uh, as we go through this, this text will understand why it was written. And so we ask the question, why was Obadiah written, and, and, and how can I apply this to my life? How can I understand this minor prophet just a little bit better. The main point and the focus of Obadiah is pronouncing a judgment upon the nation of Edom. Who was Edom, we may ask? They were descendants of Esau. We know Jacob and Esau, they were brothers, and how Jacob uh, took the birthright of, of Esau. Esau. Esau sold it for, you know, just some soup and thought, oh, what good is it going to be? I don't need it. And then not only did he take his birthright, but he also took his blessing. When we, we read through the scriptures and uh, here's uh, Isaac given a blessing to who he thought was his oldest. And it turned out it was, it was Jacob with uh, animal skin and animal fur. And then I asked, how hairy was Esau? You know, you, I'm, I'm sure you've thought that. And here, they, he, he was mistaken uh, with this, this fur on his arm for his oldest. And so he took that blessing from Esau. Esau hated Jacob. We see that in the text of Genesis 27. Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Esau is looking for a blessing after Jacob stole it. And this was the blessing that Isaac gave to his son Esau. Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. So saying, basically, your kingdom, your kin are not going to live where there's going to be plenty. And we know that Edom was up in the mountains, was up in the rocks, and they, they utilized that for their own pride and arrogancy. But again, the text continues, by your sword you shall live, and they were a ruthless people, and you shall serve your brother, but when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. 
Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he's saying, my dad's about to die. But after that, after I mourn for my father, I'm going after my brother. He hated uh, Jacob. And the text continues, and uh, eventually we see that Jacob is very afraid of his brother, and he offers all these different things as he, as he sees Esau and those 400 people coming, and great army coming, so to speak, in, in his mind. And so he's, uh, eventually they rekindle, eventually they reconnect, and, and uh, outside of that, we don't see much more about Esau until we get to the book of First Kings and the Chronicles, where the nation of Edom, which would be Esau's uh, kin, his children, they're against Jacob. They're against Israel. They're against Judah. And God did not look at that very favorably. Time passes, and we see that his descendants build up cities in the mountains and in the rocks, and their pride and their selfishness was evident. We see that in, um, in, the, in Obadiah here even. Uh, we, we see in verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. So it's explaining where they're living here in, in Obadiah. It's prophesied here that Edom would be repaid for mistreating God's people. We read that in the pages of Obadiah. It's prophesied here, but also in Ezekiel chapter 25, thus says the Lord God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, says the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. I will make it desolate. So we come to this nation of Edom, the own brothers fighting against one another and the hatred of Edom against God's people was clearly evident. As Babylon came in, as other nations came in and, and swept away Israel, what did Edom do? They didn't come to the defense of their brother. They watched it all take place. They may not have participated, but in a sense they said where they were. They, they, they helped capture. They may not have stabbed their own brother, but in doing so, they backstabbed. They were against their own brothers, and God did not look favorably. Why did that all happen? Something called pride. Pride stepped in. Pride led them to build up these cities in the rocks and in the clefts, and they thought they were better than everybody. When Israel was in distress, did they come rescue Israel? Not at all. They did not care about their own brother. There's uh, the big idea of Obadiah is simply that pride is the heart and center of sin. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Re read that in the book of James. G. Campbell Morgan says this, God is never unmindful of the actions of the enemies who take advantage of God's people when they are in a state of calamity. The punishment of such is sure. Proverbs 3, verse 34, toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. God is saying that he, his, his hatred of pride and arrogancy, God is uh, scornful to those that continue to dwell in the sin of pride. And you know, pride has not gone away. Pride is a part of each and every one of our lives. It's something that we need to suppress. It's something that we need to get out of our lives. It's, it's, uh, it's by nature, sin has, has overwhelmed each and every one of us. And it begins a lot with pride. So we ask ourselves this question, how does Obadiah fit into God's story? We recapped a couple of it, but on the, on the back of your uh, handout, wrong handout, but uh, I have it here in my notes, but uh, you may see it says the big idea, or I'm sorry, the, the, how does Obadiah fit into God's story? God's covenant to Abraham was the preservation of his children. Preservation of his children. The negligence of Edom was viewed as a violent act against God pe God's people. Even though they may not have directly killed their own brother, they were negligent. They just let it happen. And God viewed that as an act of violence against his people. 
They may not have directly attacked Israel, but their negligence was viewed as such. Judgment upon all nations is pronounced here in Obadiah, and the final restoration of Israel is predicted in the latter, latter verses of Obadiah. So when we say, all right, that's great. It's a history book. I understand that. Edom, Israel, I think I'm getting it all together. So now what? How can I apply Obadiah, this, this minor prophet? There's only a handful of verses. There's only 21 verses for me to, to take from. What can I learn from this story? Number one, failure to help one's own brother is condemned by God and will carry consequences. Galatians 6 verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's our church. That's our brothers. That's our sisters in Christ. And as we have the opportunity, let us continue to do good, especially, then it says especially to those of the household of faith. Number two, pride is the heart and center of sin and can cause us to act, act inappropriately to our brother. Pride is so central to so much of our sin. We're always taking God off the throne of our heart, putting him over there and saying, God, you stay there for just a moment. I'm, I'm on my Monday through Saturday, but on Sunday, God, I'm going to take me, put me here, and I'm going to push you back. God, that's where you belong. But just for a day, just for a couple hours, uh, maybe an hour, God. Uh, other than that, you stay over there. That's what we're doing. And what is that? That's pride. That's arrogancy. That's saying, God, I'll, I'll have you every once in a while, but Lord, you don't have my heart at all times. Pride is the heart and center of sin. What's the antidote of this horrible venom? It's humility. Humility is the antidote to pride and the first step into repentance. There is a link between judgment for sins and the restoration of the repentant sinner. That, that, that happens when, when we're going through those times of consequences. We say, God, I'm sorry. God, take me, put me elsewhere, and I want you back where you belong. I turn from my sin, and I, I'm keeping you there because I keep messing up. I keep failing. I'm so thankful for verses like 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness every time we take God off the throne, put him to the side. If we confess and say, God, you belong there, he is faithful. He is forgiving. He casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember them anymore. And we think to ourselves, well, I've forgiven a brother before, but I'm not going to let it happen again. I'm going to not forget about it, but I will forgive them. Is that really true forgiveness? Has pride stepped in our way where we, says, where we say to ourselves, I can't truly forgive. God truly forgives you of your sin. He, you have separated yourself from God. Sin has separated that, uh, you from God, but yet God has forgiven when you confess and repent of your sins. We see a couple of key verses in the pride of Edom. Verse 3 talks about the pride of your heart. Verse 10 talks about the violence done to your own brother Jacob. Verse 21 talks about how the saviors will, shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Ultimately, God gets the glory in all things. He will always have the glory. Whether you put him there or not, he will always have the glory. But our job as believers, you may say, I'm not a believer this morning. I don't know if God has ever been the throne of my heart because I have never asked him to be there. I've never once placed him there. I'm still lost. I'm still on my way to hell. I'm still without God because I've never confessed and I've never repented. I never believed that Jesus truly was the son of God. I've never believed in the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I've never done that. Don't let pride keep you from doing such thing. If I were to ask for a raise of hands, I'm not going to do that, but I'll raise my hand. How many of us have pride? I'll put my hand up. You don't have to, but now I know who has pride. I'm just kidding. We all do. We all could raise our hand. 
selfishness, self-worship are part of our daily lives and our daily struggle. I'm not minimizing that. Don't hear me out. I struggle. We all struggle, and we're struggling through this together as a church, and we need to put that to the side, and we look to Obadiah, and we see the story of Esau and the kingdom of Edom. We see that the central part of it, as it says in verse 3, is pride. And pride is dangerous. James Montgomery Boyce says the root of pride is saying that we can do without God. When you have pride in your heart, you're saying, God, I'm taking you from the throne. I'm putting you over here because I can do life without you. That is pride. And that's the root of pride. And it's venomous. It's harmful, and we're going to look at that this morning. The venom of pride, the first, is that pride makes one despised. It makes one despised. We see in the second verse, Behold, I will make you small among nations. You shall be utterly despised. For the Edomites and the wrongful act toward Israel, God despised them. Despised is such a strong word. It means disgraced. It means terrified. It means shattered. It means broken. It means destroyed. It means dismayed. All of those are synonymous with despised. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. When pride is evident, this word despised, disgraced, happens to you. And we need to turn from that. The text continues of Proverbs 11. But with the humble is wisdom. What is the opposite of this feeling of being despised, disgraced? We find the same word in Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. Despised. Broken. Terrified. Destroyed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Put God back on that throne. Don't put self there. Putting self there will only lead down this road of being despised. And when you set pride to the side and you set self aside, you're claiming that God is the center and he is on the throne of your heart. Pride makes one despise. Secondly, Pride defies God. Pride, again, that central part of pride, saying that I can do without God. Edom was saying the same thing. I can do without God. I can treat my brother this way. I can do these things without any kind of consequence. And it defies God. The Edomites, they set up their cities. They gloated about their cities. They've chiseled out cities from the rock, and they thought that they were just strong. They prided themselves on the safety that the mountains provided, that the fortresses were grand, extravagant. They thought their cities were protected. It may have been protected against Israel. It may have been protected against Babylon, but it wasn't protected against the wrath of God that came down on the nation of Edom because of their pride. Where does this defying God begin? When did this all start? starts all the way back in Genesis 3. And you may know where I'm going with this. Genesis 3, 1. The serpent was much more crafty than any other beast of the field that, God, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? What's the central of, centrality of that? It's pride. He's, uh, Satan was trying to reach the heart of, of Adam and Eve about pride. Did God actually say? You don't need to listen to God. You don't need to have God on the, on the forefront of your heart, on the throne of your heart. Put self there. All lies that we believe. God is the central part of our heart. He should be there. What should have been the proper response with Adam and Eve? It should say, God said it. And I'm not going to defy God by inserting my own opinion. I'm not going to question God in that way. God was, is looking out for the best interest of me, and I'm going to believe him. He said, trust in me, and I'm going to trust in him. God said to do this. I'm not going to disobey him. I'm going to keep God there. Look with me in Proverbs chapter 6. If you turn back there, Proverbs chapter 6. And verse number 16. 
Proverbs 6, verse 16. The text says this, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, or a haughty eyes, your translation may say. A lying tongue. Number three, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Number five, feet that make heart haste to run to evil. Six, a false witness that breathes out lies. And number seven, the one who sows discord among brothers. Do you see who's leading the parade of these sins? If you're, if you're observing this train coming through, who's, who's the engine? A proud look. Have, uh, let's think through this for, for a moment. If we work on the first thing of this list, a proud look, what's going to happen with the others? Augustine said this, the source of sin is pride. Uh, Spurgeon says this, pride may be set down as the sin of human nature. If we worked on pride, would we have a lying tongue? Why would we need to boast about self? Or why would we need to get out of trouble if pride's not the center of things? If we have struggle with pride, if we have a, a wrong view of self, when someone accuses us, when someone says, hey, uh, you know, how, how big was the fish that you caught this past weekend? Well, it was you know, this big. In reality, <laughs> you're that big. A lying tongue. It's pride. It's boasting of oneself. If we worked on pride, would we murder? Would we, would we have a sense of injustice that would take matters into our own hands? That wouldn't be a thing if we would work on pride. Would we devise a wicked plan? No, it's to make me feel better, pride. Why would we run and make haste to run to evil? Maybe that's our, our drug of choice, or maybe that's your liquor of choice, or maybe that's your music of choice, or maybe that's your language of choice, or what have you. Whatever the sin may be, why are you running to that if pride is not the issue? Why would we give a false witness? Why would we be on the stand and say, is this brother, is he, or is this person, is this uh, person really guilty? And maybe you witness that. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want them to come at me. I don't want them to hurt me. I don't want... So why would you lie? Because of pride. And lastly, why would we sow discord among the brothers? Again, to make ourselves feel better. It even become a false sense of injustice. We wouldn't do that if pride was not part of it. Pride. Then we come to the last part of the venom of pride. We see this. Pride destroys souls. Pride destroys souls. In verse 7, all your allies have been driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you, and you have nothing. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau and your mighty men? shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Pride is what elevated Edom to their position. Pride is what they looked down on Israel and said, <laughs> Babylon, do whatever you want to them. I know they're my brothers, but here, I'll even tell you where they are. We'll even help you capture them. Pride was the central part of their sin. It destroyed souls. It led Edom down to road of destruction. You will not find Edom today. You won't find any one of the descendants of Esau here today. God may do with his promise, and Edom was completely wiped out. So what is the antidote? You say, I am discouraged. I, I, don't, um, I don't know what I can do. And, uh, and I heard this this past weekend. You will never hear God say for a solution to any problem, just be selfish. You won't hear that from God. Just be selfish. Just have pride at the center. So what is the solution to these problems? Pride's antidote. Number one, humility presents itself a sacrifice to God. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12 as we uh, wrap this message up of, of pride by looking at the answer. Looking at the antidote of this venom. Romans chapter 12. It presents ourself a sacrifice to God. That's the first step into dealing with pride. Pride is so dangerous. Pride is, again, as we looked at what others have said, that it's the central part of sin. 
So how do we overcome it? Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what does this look like? Okay, a, a, a sacrifice? I mean, I know what sacrifices the Old Testament are. So you want me to be like Isaac and climb up on the altar and let someone stab me? No, that's not what we're t- saying. Verse 2 answers this for us. This is what it means to be a living sacrifice. To not be conformed to this world, but by transform, by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To not be conformed to this world. What is world? World is defined in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things of this world. Here's the answer. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. There's that word pride again. That's part of the, of, of the world's philosophy and scripture saying to not be conformed to this. That's what it means to have a living sacrifice. So how do I v- avoid the world? How do I uh, keep these from entering into my life? Matthew 6 defines it by saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Humility involves a sacrifice to God. Secondly, humility produces a selfless reflection. Romans 12.3 says this, For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. This verse is saying that we're not exalting ourselves more than we should. If, if pride is not an issue, we're not going to be exalting oneself above everyone else. Here's a poem that um, I'll read it in case it's too small for you that um, Adrian Rogers uh, read. He says, sometimes when you're feeling important, sometimes when your ego is up, sometimes when you're taking for granted that you are the prize winning pup. Sometimes when you feel that your absence would leave an unfillable hole, just follow these simple instructions and see how it humbles your soul. Take a bucket and fill it with water. Put your hand up to it to the wrist. Now pull it up fast and that hole that remains is the measure of how you will be missed. You may splash all that you please as you enter and stir the water galore. Uh, but stop it and you will find in a minute it's right back to where it was before. Saying that this verse is, is describing that we are not to think of himself more highly than we ought to think. That our life is but a vapor as James says. We appear for a little time and then vanish away and when we're puffing ourselves up, when we're filling ourselves with pride and arrogancy, it's just going to leave a vacant hole. This verse is also describing that we should not live this life with false uh, humiliation and and false uh, humility. uh, Note that self-condemnation is just as evil as self-admiration. We are God's creatures. If you are a believer, you are a child of God and should live like it. We should not simply state how bad we are just to fish for compliments. Humility produces a selfless reflection. And then lastly, humility provides service to others. If you really want to put aside pride, serve others. It's a tremendous feeling of accomplishment when you get to serve them. Perhaps that's your love language is service to others. Utilize that love language this week. Utilize what God has given to you and set self aside for just a moment and say, God's grace is so good and I'm going to serve others. This idea of pride, it's, it's destructive. You say, I don't really have a problem with pride. Then we should thank God for that, but also be aware because it may creep in. 
itself is, is destructive if left to one's uh, own accord. As it says in Romans chapter 12, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, again as a church, put our church there, though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We see unity in this passage. And even in Obadiah, we see unity because when you're unified for the wrong reason as the kingdom of Edom was, they gladly gloated and watched uh, Israel be destroyed. But, you know, if they were unified with their brothers, boy, how the tables could have turned. God could have used Edom tremendously to help his brothers. But because they didn't, because they didn't surrender to the Lord, because they, they put self before they put others, God ultimately destroyed them. Let us continue to remember surrender and submission. And we're going to close out today by singing together, Blessed Assurance. And so church, will you please stand? We're going to sing together, Blessed Assurance. But let's pray before we close. Father, we come to this time of the service when we heard this message and it was a hard one. It wasn't one that I was prepared for, but God, it was in the passage that you have for us to read today. And I ask that as the message went out, that we will just simply put aside ourselves and turn to you and put you back on the throne of our heart because that's where you belong. Lord, we don't deserve to be on our own throne, but God, you do. Your grace is sufficient. You are enough, Lord, and we just ask that you help us today. Help us to have that assurance that you have forgiven us. And Lord, if one needs to ask for forgiveness, if one needs to repent of their sin, help them to do that as we close out the service. Bless this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story.
Father, we pray for this day and as we go out that you would continue to transform us, to conform us to your will, to, um, to make us more like you. We pray for those this week that have um, things happening for surgeries. There's a lot of important things um, that are happening. We pray for that. Um, we just pray for um, this week that you would build us up, that we would be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. Thank <laughs> you.